Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. We have a panel convened to talk about Vexus. Really exciting uh, presentation with plenary presentation yesterday at ACR um, 21, the virtual convergence meeting. I'm joined by uh, the person who did that presentation, Marcella Ferrada from the NIH, and also by one of the co-investigators, Dr. David Beck, who's at NYU. Thanks for joining me, folks. Thank you Thanks for, for having, having us. Okay, so for the audience, um, I'm going to give you their lay rheumatologist understanding of this new Vexus syndrome. It started with, got a, it sort of really was a, a, a big to do last year, as it was described by Dan Castor in one of the sessions, but it's been in the literature since 2020. This year, and that was one paper, and 2021 is already 45 papers. So this is sort of taking off. It's a, it is a, a genetic disorder, it's in the auto inflammatory. Um, group, if you will, it's a somatic mutation of UBA1 um, found, and it's been found in bone marrow cells, and it has, you know, fever and a bunch of other presentations. Uh, it has looked like and has been discovered amongst patients with relapsing polychondritis and sweet syndrome and some other vasculitides. Um, so that's where we start with Vexus. Um, you, the experts, want to add to that definition or understanding of the condition? Marcella? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that uh, an important point is that this is a, an overlap between inflammatory features and hematologic features. And you are correct. The clinical manifestations can be very heterogeneous, uh, but the most common diagnosis in our cohort has been a uh, relapse in polychondritis, but the, clino the clinical phenotype continues to expand. Um, so I think that that is an important point uh, to take. Uh, and of course, the importance of uh, molecular diagnostics, which is what David did uh, last year in the process of um, discovering this disease. So I don't know if, if maybe David want to talk about more. And over this last year, since the Vexus syndrome has caught on and we've received more and more referrals, we've, we've been able to identify patients earlier on in their course. So that's part of what uh, our plenary was about is identifying some of the risk factors for disease progression. Um, but we really, um, we've received uh, quite a number of referrals and we were able to make a 50% diagnostic rate. So this is a disease that's readily recognizable. Um, physicians can identify it via our first report, which is something that um, we were quite pleased to see that it's held true. Yeah, I think that that is a very important point. You know, the fact that we were able to capture the main clinical features for most of for many physicians to be able to recognize it, I think that that is very important because uh, the pattern uh, continues to be the same. I understand that the clinical phenotype is expanding, but these patients are being able to be recognized based on the main clinical features. So. Um, I heard from a wise guy rheumatologist yesterday, I'm an average community rheumatologist. Do you really think I'm going to see any Vexus out there? I point to the data that you showed yesterday, Mar Marcella, of a, a review of what, 60 or 70 relapsing polychondritis patients, and you found 8% of those actually met criteria for Vexus. So it's out there. And, and David, your report of these cases coming in um, at a big rate, these cases out there, um, and, and I think that people need to know about the syndrome. Oh, absolutely. And I think that this is more common than, than people think it is. Uh, I think that this is going to be a, a, a very common condition, I suspect. Right, David? Yeah, no, I think that um, we were surprised with the number of cases that we identified in our original report, and it's continued to um, increase as awareness has um, increased. So I think that this is going to be one of the more common auto-inflammatory genetic conditions. It probably already is. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're, we're beginning to understand some of the clinical, the biomarkers for disease severity, um, the prognostic markers. And I think that's the, the focus of what our talk was yesterday, um, kind of being able to provide some guidance for um, uh, what are the prognostic indicators. So let's get into that. Yesterday, um, Dr. Ferrati, you uh, pointed out these three mutations involving valine, leucine, and I guess threonine. And you want to explain that and what that means here to diagnosis and prognosis? So um, the mutations, those are the most common mutations that lead to Vexas uh, syndrome. And we found that the most, the, the one that is associated with worse prognosis is uh, the 
change between methionine and valine, uh, we found that those patients die more, but David can talk more about the genetic aspect uh, of the disease. Yeah, so these mutations are all at the um, codon, the, the amino acid that initiates the translation, the production of a protein, UBA1B. And that's an enzyme that's very important for ubiquitilation in the cell. And so these different mutations, what they're doing is they're um, uh, decreasing the amount of protein production uh, to different degrees. The valine actually makes the least amount of protein and has the most severe course for the patients, whereas the leucine threonine make more of the protein and they have a milder. Um, and that's just one of the uh, prognostic factors that we've identified. Um, Dr. Farada can go into a little bit more detail about that, those uh, mm -hmm. other factors. Yeah, so we we uh, also look at other uh, clinical characteristics that we thought will be important uh, for outcomes and prognosis, particularly survival. And then we included transfusion dependent, and then we found that transfusion dependent uh, was the uh, one of the predictors, the strongest predictor associated with with mortality. And to our surprise, when we look at a, at a larger cohort that included the 83 patients, we found that in terms of the clinical manifestations, uh, ear chondritis was the one that was associated with actually a, a better prognosis, um, which we found uh, very interesting. And then we suspect that it's probably likely because the ear chondritis is is an early symptom. So the time between the uh, symptom onset uh, uh, until that it was probably longer in those particular patients. So right now, since there, we don't have widespread availability of genetic testing, you're suggesting these clinical profiles give you prog prognostic information. The transfusion being a surrogate for myelofibrosis and hematologic involvement with anemia, thrombocytopenia, et cetera. Is that what you're suggesting by that? We actually have not seen tremendous amount of myelofibrosis. I will call it more a surrogate of bone marrow failure. Uh, and uh, most of the patients tend to have uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia. Um, a smaller group of patients will also have leukopenia, but it is the anemia and the thrombocytopenia uh, what we have seen uh, most commonly in these patients. So what can the rheumatologist do besides giving Dr. Beck a call at, the, at, at NYU and transferring the consult um, for testing? Um, how can we go about diagnosis or where, where's the future going to go as far as diagnosis, David? So I think that it's only a matter of time before more commercial companies are testing for Vexus. It's just sort of the speed of identification hasn't really, the, the uh, commercial companies haven't really caught up to it. Um, and I think some of them will, we know that GDX will start testing for it very soon. So you don't just have to go through the NIH or myself to test. Um, but I think that there's going to be more genetic causes. We're already identifying new mutations in UBA1 that cause Vexus. So it's not just going to be limited to these few mutations um, and probably other genes that are causing the same phenotype. Similar to what happened um, with Dr. Kastner, um, my postdoctoral mentor, when he identified familial Mediterranean fever, the genetic cause, the patients who were negative for mutations in, in uh, um, MEFE, they end up having different genetic mutations that drove their diseases. So we think that the patients that don't have a UBA1 mutation may have other genetic causes. So if you have patients that you have a strong suspicion that they have vexus, but they've been negative for testing for known causes, you know, that's where the research arm of being able to identify new causes and continue this cycle of research leading to clinical implications for patients. I mean, it's something that I'm focusing my group on. How do we get from uh, interfering with UBA1 to fever and marrow failure and, you know, chondritis and whatnot? I mean, so where does the inflammasome come into this? And uh, can you connect those dots? So we can't just yet. It's something that we're working on. So ubiquitilation has an important role in regulating NF-kappa-B, the signaling downstream. We've identified uh, multiple different disorders that are caused by mutations in the ubiquitilation pathways. So HA20, Otulin, 
Um, and so there's a lot of regulation there, but, but exactly how loss of UBA1 leads to this exact, this phenotype isn't clear, especially because chondritis isn't seen in other auto-inflammatory diseases. So there's something unique about this. And I think that that's what makes it exciting from the research side is that we're starting to get clues about how relapsing the, the pathobiology of relapsing polychondritis. And similarly, this question of other rheumatologic diseases being caused by UBA1 mutations. We have patients that really look very much like um, other diagnoses, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and, but they'll have the same genetic cause. They'll have the same genetic mutation UBA1. So clearly this mutation can have a, uh, can result in uh, promoting uh, inflammatory disease, but maybe not only one specific phenotype, maybe a diversity of phenotypes. I want to say that um, I see a fair number of auto-inflammatory consults, and and I promote the idea that when you don't meet criteria for stills or for you know FMF that are that are very clear, um, it's the atypical patients who really need to undergo genetic testing. And I use have used Invitae and a few others um, to get batteries of genes, and maybe this will be included in those batteries going for, going forward. But I think rheumatologists are ready for this approach to the diagnosis and management of their patients. And that's why this, um, this information, this research that you've done is so important because like we've learned, I guess, about the many different variants that are associated with FMF, um, you know, the variants that we're gonna get with UBA1 could tell us a lot more about other diseases, um, could shed light on things that we don't yet know about. Um, again, David, you mentioned earlier that you, were work, you worked with a, uh, Dr. Kastner before, and I asked you the question, how many patients in the auto-inflammatory fever clinic had a genetic diagnosis? You want to give us that number again? So, so about 30% have a genetic diagnosis of the patients and 70% don't. And the, of those 70%, we continue to look for causes over time. And some of the vexus patients were in that 70%. And so it just took us time to have enough evidence from other patients and other sequencing efforts to be able to identify those. Um, so part of the process is your suspicion to send patients for genetic testing. They may not have a known cause now, but if it's reevaluated or looked at for research, new causes, we may be able to identify something. So that's why people shouldn't hesitate to reach out. If they have a patient that's really atypical, we'd be happy to help um, be involved in their care. Yeah. So I Oh, sorry. No, I, I just I just wanted to highlight the um you know uh, along those lines of how to identify these patients and how we you know have demonstrated we have a, a little algorithm in patients that have relapsing polychondritis that we found if you have a patient that a male patient that has relapsing polychondritis with an MCV more than a hundred and platelet less than two hundred you should highly suspect uh, at this patient to have vexas but. Uh, but again, I, I think that it should not be limited only to that. Why 200 in platelets? That's still a normal level. Uh, this, this was an algorithm that we did with all the samples that we have uh, when we mm -hmm. evaluated our relapsing polychondritis cohort and then compare the uh, like objective measurements that we could identify as a potential markers to uh, be able to recognize these patients. So I've been in a number of groups having discussions like this and I've canvassed a lot of people. And I'm seeing about one in 10 rheumatologists who've had some brush with vexus, either considered vexus or diagnosed, um, but no one has a clue on treatment. I've heard give everybody steroids. Um, you know, the, I've heard an anecdote of tocilizumab. The, the, do either of you want to weigh in on this at this point? I'll, I'll take the easy part of this question. I'll leave Dr. Ferrata, my partner in crime with the tough part. Um, so I think we're going to learn more as we're getting more and more referrals and seeing more patients as we're identifying this disease earlier, we're going to understand the course of it. Um, and that's kind of where this evolution has happened in the project from first identifying the genetic mutation to now finding out the risk factors for severe disease and then kind of um, going into when people are treated with different agents. We've seen some efficacy for some of the biologics and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Friday, we'll go into this in a little more detail, but um, really we think that there's different phases of this disease and maybe different trajectories that patients are on and not lumping them all together just because they have the same genetic etiology. If a patient is, you know, uh, in a certain stage, they may respond differently. So that, that's, I think in large part where our thinking is at the moment, but um, uh, what do you think? Dr. Historically, that's the, yeah. historically, that's been the approach for RA, lupus, and then even FMF. So yeah, we have to learn with time, but 
Um, Marcelo, what do you think? Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think that, again, this disease, it is heterogeneous, and, and David is absolutely right. What we have seen in, in the large cohort that we have the opportunity to evaluate so far is that patients are at different stages. So you will have patients that require tremendous higher doses of steroids, where all other ones will require a moderate dose, and then you have the patients that are going to become transfusion dependent. And then I think that treatment needs to be targeted for uh, those particular groups, depending on the stage of, of the disease are where they're at. In terms of steroid sparing agents, uh, we have seen um, at least partial response to tocilizumab pretty consistently in combination sometimes with other medications. Um, they still require a little bit of steroids while they take tocilizumab, but it works at least for a period of time. Uh, and some patients uh, had very bad skin reactions to anakinra, so that is something to keep in mind because they could have very large ulcers um, when they get treated with anakinra. So that would be something that uh, I will consider in if, I mean, as a treatment, I will be a little bit concerned about using that particular drug, but what it works is um, steroids. And again, for patients that would be eligible to get a bone marrow transplant, uh, that is also a strong consideration when they become transfusion dependent. All right, Marcella, David, thank you very much for this very uh, helpful insight into a new and difficult disease. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.